So this is on lesions mimicking, uh, interoperative mice mimicking common lesions. So the format of the talk is like this. So we look at common clinical signs which we come across day in and day out in our routine practice and if some of these may harbor more sinister lesions underneath. So let's start with a common problem which we face in the OPD which is a patient presenting with hyperpion. So this is a 25 year old lady who presented with bilateral hyperpion. So one of the first things you would think of is probably an endogenous endophthalmitis. So that's, an, that's the way we look at it. But then this patient had actually leukemia. So what are the clues? Are there any clues to say that this is not an infective etiology but then uh, more, but then an underlying more sinister pathology? Yes, we can see here there is hardly any circumcorneal congestion or conjunctival congestion. And if you look at the hypopion itself, it's got a convex margin and appears to be composed of larger cells and doesn't seem to shift easily. So when you look at hypopion, which is composed of larger cells, it doesn't shift easily and probably convex and there's hardly any inflammatory signs, then you think that there is something else which is, cause, which is the cause for the hypopion rather than an infective cause. This is a young child. I don't know why the video is not playing. Ah, this is how the child presented with. This child had hypopion and was suspected to have a post-traumatic endophthalmitis, had had vitrectomy and lensectomy, multiple surgeries. And actually the intraocular specimen was sent for cytology also, but then like they didn't pick up anything. And subsequently the child came to us, you can see that there is a thick hypopion with these nodules on the surface of the iris. And subsequent to this, we did a simple AC tag which showed the retinoblastoma cells and we gave an intravitreal melphalan and this is what happened post intravitreal melphalan. You can see the corneal edema is regressed and the vitreous cells are clear. We are able to see the fundus. This is a diffuse anti-infiltrating retinoblastoma. Coming on to vitritis, this is the classic presentation of a, a more sinister lesion or a malignant lesion mimicking a uveitis. These are patients who have gone to multiple uveitis specialists who have been treated for about like uh, six months to a year without resolution. They keep recurring, the recurring, and they keep on having this problem. The clue is here. What looks like this corrugated patches, actually, if you see clearly, if there is this pigmentation on the surface, the leopard spot appearance. So this, the presence of the vitritis along with the sub-RP, sub-retinal, the leopard spot lesions are indicative of a primary intraocular lymphoma. None of the videos are playing for whatever reason. So in these situations, what we would do is to do a vitreous biopsy. Here we did a vitreous biopsy as well as a subretinal biopsy. We did a small retinotomy and removed what was there underneath and which did, it did prove it to be an intraocular lymphoma. So this is the same patient post radiation. You can see the vitreous cavity is clear. All the lesions have regressed. Of course, nowadays we don't use uh, radiation as a primary treatment, we use rituximab or methotrexate intravitreal as the primary treatment and resistant patients are the ones which are treated with radiation. So what we saw was a primary intraocular lymphoma, so which is associated seen as lymphoma. The other one is the uveal lymphoma which is associated with, associated with the systemic lymphoma. So if uveal lymphoma is uh, beneath the RPA, beneath the Brooks and you can see these to be in the choroid. So these lesions sometimes can mimic an age-related macular degeneration. I myself have had patients what looked like AMD, which looked like a small pigment epithelial detachment which is not going away, could actually be a coronal lymphoma. So if it's looking a little atypical or not responding to treatment with anti-VEGF like the way you should, then look at, look, look at, like, look at whether we are missing a uveal lymphoma. This again is none of the videos are playing anyway. So this was a rare patient of lymphoma presenting at frosted branch angiitis. This patient was bilaterally blind with a lot of vitreous exudation. And post doing a vitrectomy, we found that like all the vessels were infiltrated with the lymphoma cells and presented like a frosted branch angiitis. Let me s show you a series of four or five patients. This was a 25 year old lady who presented with multiple of the serosanguinous detachments in both the eyes and she also had headache. So probably it's the VKH. And this was a 70-year-old gentleman who presented with scleritis in the superior temporal quadrant and associated with an exudative uh, caudal detachment and an inferior retinal detachment. There was another lady who had something like an infective or an inflammatory granuloma overlying the optic disc associated with an exudative retinal detachment. And this patient had this small lesion which 
which grew in size right in front of her eyes and went on to cause a combined central retinal artery and a vein occlusion and patient became no light perception this side. So what is common to all these four patients is that all of these are intraocular metastasis. So the, what are the clues? They don't have uh, or they have very minimal inflammatory signs and the classic metastasis presents like this cream colored shallow elevation multiple involving the posterior pole. And metastasis always has a disproportionately large amount of retinal detachment in contrast to the size of the lesion and may have some amount of leopard spot pigmentation. But as you could see in the last four slides, metastasis always doesn't present classically, so they can be very, very atypical. So this is the same patient who presented like VKH. Actually, this patient had CA breast and metastasis is not a disease of the elderly. You can have younger patients like this patient who is 25 years old. And post-treatment, you can see all the lesions have vanished. And this lady had actually had had a bilateral mastectomy and about five years after that she developed this. She was only 35 years of age and uh, despite the treatment, this lesion would not go. Despite a systemic treatment, this lesion at the optic disc, the optic disc meds would not uh, regress and subsequently we had to treat it with intravitreal chemotherapy and anti vegf agents following which the lesion regressed but of course she, was, she landed up with optic atrophy. This gentleman, a 70-year-old gentleman who presented with choroidal detachment actually had METs involved in the inferior part of the fundus, but then this was some kind of a reactive choroidal detachment and post-treatment, actually primary was a cholangiocarcinoma. Post-treatment, you can see this is where the METs was and the retinal detachment regressed. Another clinical sign which we come across is macular exudation. So here we see a young patient with macular exudates. So what could be the cause? So the clue is here, if you follow these blood vessels to the periphery, we will see this tumor, which is the retinal hemangioblastoma, which can cause exudation in the macula. And you can see the exudates have gone away post-treatment with laser photopigmentation. Yet another patient who had presents with something like a neuroretinitis. And incidentally, patient has a melanocytoma of the optic nerve head. So is it incidental or is it the cause for the neuroretinitis? If you look carefully, there is, it's associated with optic neuritis as well. So a melanocytoma of the optic disc, when it undergoes necrosis, it can set up an inflammation in the optic nerve, setting up something like a neuroretinitis or an optic neuritis. This can be associated with decrease in vision as well. So it's not a sign of a malignant transformation, just that the necrosis is setting up an inflammation. So you can treat these patients with steroids and they get better. So vasoproliferative in the, like in the, uh, like earlier on the topic of exudates, and another lesion which causes ex extensive like subretinal exudates is the vasoproliferative tumor. It's a classic vasoproliferative tumor. You can see the vessels are not dilated too much. And you can see an yellow-orange tumefaction in the inferior periphery. Usually it's in the inferior associated with exudative retinal attachment and exudates. Epimacular membrane is a disease usually of the elderly or unless the patient has had a trauma. When we see epimacular membrane in children, so this is a child, 12-year-old with epimacular membrane. So unless there was history of trauma or inflammation, then we have to look at some of the signs. So what are we looking at? If you are looking at a combined hematoma of retinal, retinal pigment epithelium, you can see this like the pin cushion like uh, elevations on the surface of the retina. Not uh, pathognomonic, but this is a sign that this could be a combined hematoma. This is a more classic appearance of a combined hematoma. You can see the pigmentation, RP pigmentation, and you can see the gliosis involving the retina as well as the preretinal space. Most of the time, we'll watch these patients very, very rarely. We can do a vitrectomy to remove the epiretinal component, but the visual prognosis is not too great in these patients. There's another patient who had been on treatment for what looked like a granuloma here. This patient, this was a young child who was on treatment with systemic steroids. But what looks like a granuloma here is actually a cavernous hemangioma of the retina with the traction retinal detachment. And uh, this was, the traction was exerting onto the fovea and post-treatment you can see some amount of regression of the traction retinal detachment and this is the cavernous hemangioma. Similarly, this 32-year-old patient present with subretinal hemorrhage and preretinal hemorrhage, we're wondering what was the reason for it and post ranibizumab and gas by Rajesh, we were able to see what this patient also had is a cavernous hemangioma of the optic nerve head. These are the classic fluorescent angiogram pictures. You can see the fluorescent caps. So because the sluggish circulation, all the cells settle down, and the plasma cap fills with fluorescent, giving rise to the plasma, uh, the fluorescent caps. And this patient was treated with photodynamic therapy with the regression of the lesion. Vitreous hemorrhage, this once again, the video is not playing. This patient had altered vitreous hemorrhage. Along with that, it had a lot of dense pigmentation within. 
and what this patient had was actually a melanocytoma of the ciliary body which presented to the disemerage. Retinal attachment. So this patient, this is a child who is about seven years old who presented with the retinal attachment, looked like an exudative retinal attachment and quotes like vascular malformations. So before we conclude it is indeed quotes, we need to image them. Actually this child had a retinoblastoma. So very rarely retinoblastoma can also present with quotes like malformations. So we should not conclude it to be quotes unless we image and confirm that. So what are the clinical signs to differentiate whether it's quotes or retinoblastoma? So in retinoblastoma you can see this white lesions which are involving the full thickness of the retina. So it can come into the vitreous cavity but like when you see full thickness white lesions involving the retina, that means it's retinoblastoma because in quotes there is nothing which is, which should involve the retina. It's just a vascular malformation and the exudates are subretinal. So here if you look carefully, we look at these lesions, you can see multiple of these yellow white lesions infiltrating into the retina, then we should suspect it's indeed retinoblastoma or not Coates disease. Coates of course is, is the xanthocoria and the retinoblastoma is leukocoria. And this is the difference in the imaging, you can see a ground glass appearance. Here you can see in retinoblastoma you can see the calcium blocking, sound transmission and orbital shadowing. And the, whereas in Coates you should be able to see the posterior Coates. To summarize, neoplastic and life-threatening lesions can present with innocuous clinical signs, so you should have a high degree of suspicion and may need appropriate biopsy in select situations. Whenever you see atypical features, consider masquerades. Thank you. Next,